All right, let's get into it. My name is David McMahon, and I'm the chief engineer for Breakthrough Listen. That means I am responsible for the back-end hardware and software that work on all the telescopes that Breakthrough Listen is using for their search. It's me and a whole team of people, it's not just me. I started working in radio astronomy a long time ago at Berkeley. So we have GPUs that we use. This is a GTX 780 Ti. This one's a little bit older than the ones we use currently. The search for extraterrestrial radio emission from nearby developed intelligent populations. When I first started working, my project was to be at the Allen Telescope Array building a correlator for imaging the radio sky. I didn't know much about SETI. I thought SETI people were kind of kooks or something, tinfoil hats, that sort of thing. But then I was up there quite a bit working alongside the SETI people and realizing they were doing some legitimate engineering work and applying the scientific method to their approach and I realized this was actually a legitimate science field and don't confuse the legitimate science part with the tinfoil hat people, which certainly do exist that we all see in the shows on TV. This certainly is a very legitimate and real scientific endeavor. So I started becoming a little bit more involved with some of the SETI projects that were ongoing here at Berkeley, like at the Arecibo telescope long before it crashed. And then when Breakthrough Wilson started, they approached me and asked me if I would be the chief engineer. And so of course I said yes. And so the first two facilities that we would be using would be the Green Bank Telescope and the Parks Radio Telescope. It's called the Murray Yang Telescope now, the Parks Observatory. And so we set out at Green Bank first. That was the easier one to do for us because it's here in the U.S. The project was announced in June of 2015, and our goal was to be on the air by the end of the year. So I spent the year-end holidays at Green Bank and produced a plot of the Voyager space probe on December 31st. So that was considered success for us. The signal comes from space, it's an electromagnetic wave. And this wave front impinges upon the array. And as it does so, the reflector focuses it down to, well, the secondary reflector and then down to the receiver. The receiver starts off with this little tiny wire. And if the wire is the right length for the wavelength you're observing, the electromagnetic wave will actually induce electrons in that wire to flow and flowing electrons makes current. And so then the amplifier is amplified enough to where you can actually put it into an analog to digital circuit. And so we can then do what's called beamforming on the data by making these signals, kind of change the delays of the signals digitally. So it can, instead of the telescope pointing here, we can make it like the telescope was pointed over there. And then after the beamforming process, we do a Doppler drift search to look for narrow band signals that might be drifting in frequency. The drifting part helps us differentiate signals that are maybe coming from Earth that are in the same sort of motion as the observatory because it's on Earth and so it doesn't have any real acceleration relative to us. So the Doppler shift or Doppler drift is zero for those signals and so we can just reject anything with a zero drift rate as being terrestrial and therefore uninteresting for us. There's a never-ending list of sort of challenges, technological challenges, to make sure we can keep all this stuff working and trying to come up with new ideas or new ways to analyze the data. How can we find ET better or how can we look in ways we haven't looked before? And a lot of the data we're saving in a public archive that will be available to researchers for, you know, forever, I guess. And so that will be just a treasure trove of you know, discovery, I think, in the years to come. I think there's probably a lot of stuff in there waiting to be discovered. I think Breakthrough Wilson has done a huge job legitimizing SETI in the broader public's mind. It's a challenging field to find young people to go into because young people starting out in their career want to publish a lot of papers with detections and you know, results. And so far, all the SETI papers to date have been non-detection papers, essentially. It's because we haven't you know, detected ET yet. So hopefully you'll be playing this back after we've detected them and this will sound all quaint and, and outdated now. Uh, that would be the best outcome ever. Well, I think the question of, you know, are we alone in the universe is age old. I think it's ever since humans have existed. And 
you know, now we have the technology where we could actually listen for signals from them in the radio or optical or we're developing other ways to listen. And I think to not do the experiment, to not listen, would be kind of turning our back on our potential, you know, cosmological neighbors. And I think that would just be a uh, tragedy. It'd be sort of, it's almost like a moral obligation. If we can search, we should search because it'd be so sad if they're trying to reach out to us and we just decided, ah, can't be bothered today to listen. So, you know, I mean, maybe the dinosaurs were getting bathed with radio signals from ET and they, you know, didn't pick up the phone or something. Uh, and so they missed out. But, uh, yeah, we have the ability to do this. And so I think uh, we should, we should listen.